I have 1,000 friends on my Facebook. As a human, you want to express, like I have opinions on everything. Every morning I post a photo of my son go to school. I really love Facebook because everybody can know where I am. My social media is my front of my house. Because I have this phone in my hand, I can suddenly share it. We post in the Facebook important word of Buddha's teaching. Inside every of this little human universe, they're having a conversation with their best friends, a conversation with their loved ones, a flirt. I share more than 5,000 photos. Data is 100% human because the algorithms were done by humans. The data was produced by humans. It says stuff about humans. You know what I like about fighting is that there's nothing fake about it. You're put up against one person and there's no excuses. It's you and another guy and you either win or you lose. It's just so pure in that way. I see myself fighting for the individual sovereign rights. I think it's very important that in society we think about each individual natural person, and I'm trying to fight for that. I don't think we've reached the point where we even totally know what the internet is. Like, it's only been around for two decades, and it's fundamentally changed the way that we do almost everything. I don't think that people are really aware of what happens to their data, right? Their data is being used by, in some instances, very large companies as a mechanism to feed them more ads or sell them something or do marketing or advertising. The companies can misuse the data, misappropriate the data, lose the data. And what we need to do is uh, decentralize our identity systems and really enable self-sovereign identity. Hi, Edmund. Hello. Where are you sitting right now? Oh, uh, in my apartment. In your apartment. It's uh, seven o'clock here, so my day is. Uh, oh, which which yeah, time zone are you in right now? Sorry. Which time zone are you in? Uh, GMT plus seven, so okay. I'm still in. I'm in Thailand. So my name is Bianca. I spent the last seven years in different ecosystems and doing pitch training for startups for investors. Which means that I get to see a lot, a lot, a lot of startups always having to understand what they do. And so that's why I get to see a lot of them in different ecosystems on different continents. So I'm super curious to find out about yours. Can you tell me what does SelfKey do? How does it work? Right. So you would use SelfKey if you want to sign up for a financial product or service and you don't want to have to go through the same repetitive process over and over again. So I like giving any names and then yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so that makes that initial onboarding a bit quicker and easier. And then we're working towards a future where you don't actually need to submit those physical documents. You can only share perhaps what's called a DID claim, an identity claim about yourself that proves that, okay, I am a German resident and um, therefore I'm eligible for this particular product or service, right? Without having to reveal your exact street address, which may be compromised somehow or just be invasive more than it needs to be.
But if you look at the most powerful companies of the digital age, right, Facebook, Google, these companies that weren't around several decades ago, and they've primarily made their money off of providing a free app, collecting as much data as possible, and then running advertising against that data. The way that we're starting to perceive data is less as a company's owned commodity and more as the individual identity owner's right over their own information. Everybody's talking about data because nobody really knows whether this is going to uh, become a monster or a big fairy. So once something is in the internet, it's like putting something on the table. It's there. You can put lots of cloths over it. You can hide it, but it's still on the table and it won't leave the table anymore. When I speak to younger people, I hear, I hear the sentence, privacy is a myth. And they say it with a very natural, like, yeah, yeah privacy is a myth, isn't it? And the way they say this, it shows to me how obvious it is for them that it's a myth. And that shows to me, okay, may, maybe, maybe it is something that is basically, like it's riding a dead horse. When I was five, I started to record the makeup videos. People who are at home, putting a camera in front of their face and telling something through that camera. That's a very intimate setting. It's like a little piece of technology and you. If you are a shy person, it just happens to have the trick that it gets spread to millions of people. So they kind of are introverted superstars in a world where everybody knows their name and wants to talk to them all the time. And that adds diversity of personality into a setting that always was ruled by alpha players with a big mouth. Since I was three, I'm playing the makeup games. Then I watch in the makeup tutorials on YouTube. Sometimes they say like it's too young to do makeup. They get really mad. Then I do makeup. I stopped for a while <laughs> because they all like say this strong word and I come back because of the support of my fans and my families too. ตอนนี้น้องทํางานได้เงินทุนในการศึกษาต่อเพราะว่าเค้าจบมอ Every 
11 year old human is trying to figure out who am I? How do I want to be? That is already too much for every kid without internet. Have a guess how hard this is to figure it out while everybody having an opinion on it. You get so much more scared because you don't want to be hurt by people who love you by saying like, no, this is bad, that two things happen. One thing is either they become really self-conscious and becoming basically a slave of the audience that they created by being afraid or there's confidence growing out of that because at some point you give up trying to please everyone because you cannot please 12 million people at the same time. <laughs> The younger people, the very first steps or words of them is like completely on media and they can access every stage of their life in directness. So if I have to look at kids' photos, I have to rely on my blurry memory and the few photos that exist about myself. Um, and so that's interesting because it probably creates a very different um, self-perception because it's relying on data, because it's everything photographed and filmed, and so you can't just make it up, you, you see that. computer, everything is digital. You need to understand that when you click, when you like, when you stop to see, you already give all the data to Facebook, to Google, to whatever. We gathering all the information from the social media. We read all the conversations that people talking about anything, anything. We are the technology to help the brand to know how to talk the right way to the right consumer with the information from the social media. The first year, you just have two people. Now we have 160 people. 160 people, wow. Yeah, yeah. They're taking me on a tour. Is this your office? Uh, yeah, that is my nice. office. Nice. The market is just like Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Myanmar, Vietnam, Japan, and Philippines. What would be an example that you could share of what's an interesting question to know for the company? Yeah. So, yeah, th they have this crisis with their shampoo product. There were a lot of consumers that complained about sticky hair, uh, sticky hair. like th that shampoo is causing sticky hair. So we put the keyword for sticky hair under the name of the product. And then we create a chart for them to see the movement of the whole timeline and whether it's going up or going down and it came out that this issue is not that severe. Though there are still negative voices online, but it's not strongly enough to, uh, for the brand to be affected. Okay. Yes. Our job is not to own the data, but our, our job is analyze the data for the brand to understand the consumer. It's scary for the people that know, don't know, right? So it's something, something new. That is the people nature. When something new, which is we don't know, we always scare of it. But we, once we know, we climb over it, we know how to utilize it, then I think it's, it's, it, it's not scary anymore. But it's a matter of time, how do we like gonna educate the consumer to understand how to utilize the digital, how to live in the digital world in the future.
if you want to keep something secret, you not use, you not share, you not post, keep it offline. The term big data is so abstract that it's really impossible for anybody to really picture it and nothing really bad has yet happened. But the potential of something really bad is going to happen is suddenly there. When the access is stopped, your life is blocked. Imagine what happens if somebody else takes his identity and then does something with it. You're going to be in big trouble proving that this wasn't you. And there were like sci-fi films about this 30 years ago. But now this becomes a very possible thing and it also comes in a very easy looking, kind of fine, pink, sweet packaging. So it doesn't really look dangerous. Social media has created or fostered uh, loneliness in people that um, you have 25,000 friends, but who is automatically showing up uh, on your birthday or when you're sad? Maybe no one. Usually they get like, oh, happy birthday on Facebook. And you read through the message and cognitively you're like, that's very nice. But the shower of emotions is not quite the same compared to imagine you would all meet them. It's like really sweet sugar of human connections, so it's very easily available, but it doesn't quite fulfill you and make you as full and well fed than meeting a human or group of humans and like touching and being next to them uh, one by one will ever do. You connect with people like um, 10,000 miles away. You connect with like a lot of stuff all at the same time, but you, um, you don't connect with yourself. And here, coming to this place, remind you of the root of your culture, the root of your heritage, and also like um, connect with your inner peace, give you a peaceful state of mind. For people that matter in our lives, sometimes we probably like um, connect with them less often. And when we are so physically close to them, we are quite far away because we focus on the um, on the technology, on the small screen. While the um, the most important person, the most important moment moment in your life, is just like um, sitting right in front of you. ลูกละเยอะว่าแต่ลูกเลยหลานมัวแต่เล่นมัวเฉยเล่นเนี่ยไม่ไม่ไม่เคยอยากเอาใจใส่ยายแล้วข้าวเคยบางทีก็ไม
What's the relationship from uh, the founders that you're working with towards something like privacy? Um, the way people here look at privacy is quite different from the um, from US, I think, and um, and I think like um, Europe as well. Mm -hmm. Basically, like um, the the concept of privacy here is kind of like collective privacy because like our, our collective culture, privacy. Yeah, exactly. Oh. I think like um, basically when we talk about individual privacy, I think it's quite um, it's quite foreign for for us. So um, oh. we are still learning about like privacy. Many things in this country is controlled by the government. So we, we may think that like, data may not, like even our own data may not belong to us. But because like, we are used to social media where we give away our data for free all the time, for free access to free services, that kind of thing, for convenience, that kind of stuff. But I would say like um, thing has changed a lot in the concept of um, data ownership. I think it's going to swing gradually to the side of like, um, it belongs to consumer and the consumer has a right to know where my data is collected and how it is going to be used. So I think like um, the pendulum is going to swing to that, swing to that side. Has the internet changed the way that we deal with identity or what identity is. I think that it has. There's not gonna be less people online next year than there is this year, so it's sort of an unstoppable macroeconomic trend that won't, you can't stop it right now. You can't turn off the internet, right? We have the internet, that's not going anywhere. The question is, how are we gonna govern it on an ongoing basis? And unfortunately, uh, you kind of have to take the good with the bad sometimes. Like if you do have a more free internet, yes, there will be you know, consequences to that, but the consequences of controlling everything I think are much more damaging than, than that of having it be more open. If you look at something like privacy, the argument against it is that if you have nothing to hide, then why do you need privacy, right? But on the other hand, when you eliminate something like privacy, they can fundamentally change the society, right? If you stifle dissent, if you stifle an opinion which isn't you know, the mass opinion or the, or the official government approved opinion, then you might lose something as a society when that happens, right? If, you, if you're not able to give people who you may not agree with a voice, then you can never really progress or iterate to something better. You're just stuck with what you have. And if anyone asks you, why do you do it that way? It's because we always have. Technology can create so much good things that it would be naive to say that's the bad devil. And on the other side, it's not that it's stoppable. It's not us who decides where technology is going. And I would even go so far like technology decides where technology is going. With the power of technology, we make human look like a god. And in the next 30 years, you can do a lot with that piece of technology. If you put it to good use, basically you can solve all the world problems. It will create abundance, 
in everything, in resources, in knowledge, in happiness, in health. It will be like a utopia. And I really hope that um, humanity will bring out the best part of them. Don't be dehumanized by technology. Bring the best part and then technology will magnify it and the world will be better.